So I am thrilled to be here. Uh, when I heard about the theme IA for good, I was very excited. I had any number of topics. Um, I care very much about privacy, data privacy, very much about what's happening with a lot of the fake news and things like that. Uh, but the topic I decided to do today is a little bit closer to what I've been working on um, for my next book, all about understanding. And I think it's when we talk about IA for good and we talk about bad, this is an invisible problem that a lot of us don't see. So I felt like that was what I wanted to devote my attention to and really, uh, really discuss. Um, the talk, the hardest part about this has not been the content itself. It's been structuring the content and organizing it in a way that's sort of relatable because it's uh, what you're seeing is what's in my head right now, and it's, it's a mess. <laughs> so it's, um, and you'll be more organized in the beginning, but as we get near the end, you'll be like, hey, I'm going to just open the Camino and show you stuff that's in progress that's, you know, uh, uh, very much early stages. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. So the title is Assembly Required when access to information isn't enough. And I'll go ahead and just start with the punchline. I think the limits of, I want to talk about the limits of information as the goal. I think for years we've heard, you know, we're architecting information or we're helping people find information or connect with information. And I want to really poke at that. Um, not because it's bad necessarily, but I think there are more things that we should or could be doing. And the, where I'm going to start is this idea that for anything more than a simple question, information is not enough. And this will make sense in just a few minutes. Um, before I get too deep in the talk, I did want to uh, establish a controlled vocabulary uh, for us. And the controlled vocabulary that I'm going to use is from the Kinevin framework and by Dave Snowden. He talks about things being simple, complicated, complex, chaotic. I've adapted that a bit for, for my purposes, but I'm going to talk about simple questions, simple queries that can be asked and answered. It doesn't mean the answering is easy, but you know that you can get an answer directly. Complicated problems, where things are complicated, there's lots of pieces and parts, but it can be solved. And I like to use a jigsaw puzzle an analogy. So whether it's a 10-piece jigsaw puzzle or a 10,000-piece jigsaw puzzle, it can be solved. Either way, it's just complicated. And there's a degree of, com of complicatedness there, right? And then complex systems are really where Things are changing. There's dynamic information. There's missing information. Uh, you know, things are not the same from, from time to time. So that's, the, as you hear me talk about simple, complicated, and complex, that's the, the controlled vocabulary that I'm going to use. All right. So uh, and a, way, a way to think about this, simple que questions or queries can be answered. Complicated problems can be analyzed. And complex systems can be played with, explored, tested, things like that. So let's talk about when simple queries work. And I've got a bunch of, you'll see throughout this presentation, just simple uh, speech bubbles. And this could be using a voice UI. This could be typing in a Google search. It could be adjusting filters. But it's, I'm classifying those as simple queries. So what is 2 plus 2? We can ask that or type it, and we can get an answer. You know, 4, right? Um, who wrote Fahrenheit 451? So it's not a calculation, it's a fact, right? And so you can type a search in Google and get back, oh, Ray Bradbury wrote Fahrenheit 451, right? Um, show me cars that fit my budget. So you might go to a car shopping site, and there's over on the side here you have price, and you can set your budget and, and find a car that fits the budget, right? What song is playing? And you can hold up Shazam, right? And you actually Shazam the song and, and, and identify what it is. And I include this one just to uh, make the point that when I say simple queries, it doesn't mean the technology is easy. Like there was a lot of work that went in to make Shazam work, and it was a bit of magic the first time we all used it, right? But it is a simple query. There's a song playing. I want to know what the song is. Tell me that. Um, we're seeing this kind of thing spread to other areas with uh, like image recognition. So there's an art app now where you can hold up the phone and identify art, right? Um, I've also seen the same thing with typography. So if there's a typeface you like, you hold it up, and it's, uh, I think it's called What the Font, and it will identify the typeface, right? So we're seeing the same sort of stuff. And even though the technology behind it's incredibly complex, um, it's a simple query, right? What is this thing? Simple question, simple answer. Um, what's the weather? And the interesting thing about this is we ask what's the weather, but that's a proxy for our real question, which is often what should I wear today, right? I know 90% of the time when I'm checking the weather, it's the first thing in the morning, and you know, I get an answer and I know what to wear. Um, <laughs> how do you pronounce? Kandefin. Uh I had been saying Sinfin for years, and it's a Welsh word, and actually it's Kandefin, actually is how you pronounce it, and so I looked that up last night. And, uh, and watch, play the little audio clip, and okay, now I know how to pronounce that. Um, even wayfinding and things like that. 
you know, which train is next? So you're coming into the airport and there's two trains to take you out of the airport. Which one? And oh, hey, there's a sign, this transit next. Where do I go for Lyft? I open up my app and it says, oh, welcome to, you know, Pittsburgh Airport. Go to arrivals and meet your driver at the purple curb to the right of door four. Great, where's door four? Oh, hey, there's door four, right? And I go there. Uh, and then where's my Lyft driver a few minutes later? And I look on the app and there's a, there's a map indicating. So these are all simple questions, simple answers, right? Not that the, getting to the answer was easy, but they are simple answers. They're very direct. So let's talk about when simple queries don't work, because that's what I'm really more interested in, the thing I care about. Should I buy a solar roof? So you type that into Google or you use a dictate that deco, and you'll get something like, uh, here's a bunch of web pages I found, right? So you don't get that answer. Which wine should I buy? Maybe you're having a party and maybe I don't know a lot about wines. Here's a list of stores near you that sell wine. That didn't answer my question, right? Because my question is a little more complicated, perhaps complex, depending. Um, help me understand my 401k. Here's some information I found about 401ks, right? They're, that's such a complex question, we haven't broken it down into something that's simple and answerable, but it is a question, like, I don't even know where to start. Like, help me understand it. Uh, that is a complex problem or, that, we're, that we're asking. Um, what will the changes in the tax laws mean for me, me personally? What will it mean for my peers or people I know? Uh, what is the best solution for my transportation needs, all things considered? So let's forget asking for a budget for a car or even talking about the best car. Let's talk about just transportation needs in general. Should I even buy a car? Should I take public transit, right? What system could, could I ask this of that would come back and give me all my options and the pros and cons of each? I don't know that one exists. Um, how do we solve the climate change problem, right? This is a complex systems level problem with lots of moving pieces and opinions and data and things like that. Maybe it's not a global shared problem like that. Maybe it's incredibly personal. My dad is dying. He needs to be discharged from the hospital. They'll no longer keep him. Where should we move him? What are our options? I went through this last year, and it was very hard. It was a lot of you know, broken down questions that we had to ask and a lot of conversations, and there wasn't good information to get an answer. So the way I think about it is like this. You request information, you get a response, and you know, presumably there's an action taken. And the action could be you click the buy button, the action could be you make a decision, the action could be, ha, I told you that was the right band, right? You, you win an argument, right? There's all sorts of actions, but you request information, get a response, and get an action taken. And I think historically, for the past several decades, we've really focused on this information request and response piece. Can we get people to the data? Whether it's a search query, whether it's browsing and navigation, that seems to have been our focus. But here's what I see happening more and more, more with more complicated and complex problems. You request information, you get a response, and that leads you to request more information or adjust it. Uh, we saw this earlier with uh, you know, uh, songs from war, right? And oh, let me clarify, right? And that use went through twice. But for many cases, when it's more complex, we repeat this process. In fact, I just read a study from Google where they're following people through the car shopping experience. And they said for their, this one case study, the person performed an average of 170 Google searches related to the car searching, buying, browsing, shopping experience. 170 times they were requesting bits of information. So there's lots of information to make sense of. And typically, where do we make sense of it? It's in our heads, right? Or maybe we model things out, we take some notes. Because we don't have tools to help us make sense of those things. We form a concept, like I said, in our heads, and then we take our action. This is what I want to talk about, is what could we do to help with the assembly of that information? Because I think there's some really interesting and exciting things that we could do to help with that, that bit. Not just the retrieval of information, but how do we get people from information to understanding? In fact, that's how I've been explaining this concept for several years now. It's almost like we have all these puzzle pieces, and we're getting these pieces one piece at a time, but no one has shown us how to actually put them together into the picture so we can actually get understanding. Make sense? See the opportunity? All right, so let's dig into a few examples and how we can do this. Um, here's a really small example of putting the pieces together. So you drive up, you see the street sign, and what are you doing in your head? The information's there, right? 
but you're trying to sort it out and say, can I park here or not? That's the question you're trying to answer. Um, this is a better proposal redesign that uh, someone has done showing where you could look up and you could see right away. So this is the, the pieces put together. That's really simple. Let's go to the other end, the other extreme. Uh, how about terms of service, legal agreements? You know, those things we check all the time and click through. How many of you have actually taken the time to read one from top to bottom? See one hand. Very good. A couple of you. Uh, usually, like, I care about that stuff, but I usually wait till other people curate and, like, surface stuff. Like, oh, you shouldn't sign that one. But, you know, that, that is something we should be reading and engaging with, but the time required to do so is enormous. I'll show you a solution to this a little bit later. All right. So, what can we do here? That's what I want to talk about for the remainder of the time. Um, this is what I've been thinking about for the last five, six, seven years, is what can we do, what can be done to help people move from information to understanding. And for the purposes of today and today's talk, I'm going to organize this in the three sort of chapters. So, what we want to talk about are ways we can help people see and play with information. See and play being the verbs. Uh, use technology to advance understanding. And that one, I have to say, as I was working on that and choosing the right verbs, advance, foster, nurture, um, advance understanding sounds like something as a, as a company's, a corporate company's uh, <laughs> slogan. But that word, advance, is exactly what I wanted. I wanted it to be something where it pushes and advances us. We're better because of it. It advances our understanding. Um, and work together, create ways to work together and learn from each other. So there's a... What can we do with visualizations and models? There's using technology to enhance that or augment what we're doing. And then recognizing that it's not just one or a few people, it's a collective. All right, so let's talk about seeing and playing with information. This has been my bread and butter for years and what I've been really enjoying in project work and then writing about and talking about. Uh, let me give you some examples, and these were video clips, unfortunately, because of the switch to PDF, you're going to have to use your imagination and go ooh and ah anyway. Um, so this is a site, uh, Nikki Case, um, he does a lot of explorable explanations, and one of them, one of several, is the parable of the polygons. Anyone seen this or been to the site? A few people? Fantastic, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. See, trust them. Um, <laughs> It, she, uh, he basically took a paper from the 1970s talking about segregation. And in that paper, uh, the researcher actually proposed a game with you could play with pennies and nickels. And you start with a few simple rules, and you play it out. No matter how mixed your pennies and your, your uh, uh, nickels were, by the end, you end up with these segregated clumps and clusters. And the point was... Let's look at a system, let's adjust a few rules and see how it plays out over time. And so if you go to this site, uh, Nikki Case has actually modeled this in an interactive system. You have triangles and squares here, and you can play it and drag, drag things out, and it increases in complexity. So it starts with three simple rules, but then more rules are added, more variables. Because remember, a system is very complex and has dozens or hundreds of variables. But by layering on just a few, you can start to run simulations and actually see what the outcomes are. And at the end, at the bottom of the page, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of you know, triangles and squares and several variables, and you can actually hit run, because at that time, you don't want to be manually dragging them. You can hit run and actually see how it plays out and whether, you, uh, whether segregation happens or not. So it's a great way to play with a system to play with a really complex problem. And again, we're simplifying the problem because you can't have every variable, but you can say, are there some variables that in this simulation actually make a difference with the problem or the issue of segregation? Um, similar note is this uh, app for iOS, Earth, a primer. And it's like an interactive textbook. It's really quite brilliant. You actually, uh, it's reading, but you can also play with and interact with all these things related to geology and the Earth. And so you can see all the parts of the Earth here, and then you can dive in and learn about lava. And you actually encourage you to drag your finger in there and create, you know, mountains and things. Uh, you know, there's lots of places you can play with, so it's very interactive. And at moments, it starts to feel more like you're playing with Minecraft than it does you're playing with a textbook or interacting with information. And I think that's really fascinating when this line between what is education or learning and what is playing could starts to blur. And you start to wonder, I'm just playing with ideas and playing with concepts. And that's the, that's the key idea here. You're seeing information in a visual way, and you're playing with it, and you're interacting with it. 
Uh, Brett Victor, who uh, talks a lot about these ideas, he's recently gave form to some of them be off the screen, and it's this project called Dynamic Land. Anyone seen this? Okay, definitely follow, look up Dynamic Land on Twitter. Go to dynamicland.org, I believe. Start checking it out. He's prototyping what computing may look like over the next several decades. And it's very early on. In fact, he says up front, it's kind of like Xerox Park back in the day, you know, when Xerox Park was making the mouse and things like that. And it's, it's a vision of computing as a communal activity that we all do together. The idea of like us working at siloed screens is, is he's like, that's passe. Like, can we get all of us in a room working and programming things together? It's about agency, not apps. So instead of downloading apps, you're actually writing apps. And it's interesting as he's been sharing bits and pieces of, of people doing things on Twitter. It looks more like it, what programming looks like is people taking scissors, cutting out pieces of paper, taping stuff, and then watching those things become interactive and having digital information. It's really quite, quite amazing. And a big idea of that is you're bringing the whole body and the whole human to it. So it's not just touching on glass or clicking on buttons, like your body is in there, you're moving, you're grabbing objects, and you're able to do stuff. People think with their bodies, people think with their hands, people spread out, walk around, compare possibilities. So the whole room, in effect, becomes this living collaboration understanding space. It's so really fascinating stuff. But when we talk about this, it's not about tech trends or exciting things that we can do now that we couldn't do a few years ago. Really, it's fundamental stuff that hasn't changed in thousands of years, right? Visual encodings, spatial arrangement, and epistemic interactions. Let me talk briefly about these. So visual encodings, those are the things we pick up in milliseconds. Like on our way, you know, between our eyeball and on our way to our brain, we recognize it and we can see those patterns and subtle differences. It's the reason I can look at an infographic like this and in a matter of seconds, I can suddenly understand the differences between major espresso drinks. And I can see the similarities, differences, the outliers, where there's water involved, where there's milk involved. Suddenly it makes sense. because so we can scan lots of information visually um, it's also why in a game you can orient the card, change the orientation, and that has meaning. Um, I was thinking of other examples of this. You go to the hardware store, and if you're looking for particular screws or nails, there's a lot of good color coding now to help you narrow your options, get to the right tools you need. Um, if you play guitar, any guitar players in here? All right. Uh, if you play guitar, you can look at someone on stage playing a guitar and recognize the guitar by the headstock, right? Like, it's, it's just a subtle shape. But if you know that shape, you recognize it and you know that's a you know, Fender Stratocaster, that's a Jazzmaster, that's a Gibson Les Paul. All these visual encodings, things that we can process right away. And you have spatial arrangement. And this is the thing I don't think we talk about enough, but it's how we use space to hold and convey meaning. And we do this all the time. So when we're sorting our clothes in the, in the closet, right? Or if we're making a complex recipe and we have lots of ingredients, the way we arrange them and the way we push things back to the back of the counter when we've already added that spice or the way we move that spice over to the other side of the oven, like we use space to hold meaning. Uh, and, and so how can, we, how can we use that in other ways? So here's an example a friend of mine does. It's a yearly adventure now with his wife. Um, they go to watch the next Star Wars movie, and uh, she didn't grow up on Star Wars, and so she's like, wait, another Star Wars movie? What's this one? Where does it fit in? So he's drawn this out every year, and this was uh, most recently for The Last Jedi. And uh, if you've not watched Star Wars movies, here you go. In one page, here, this will make sense of all of this. So you have the original trilogies, you have the sequels, you have the prequels, he just put not so great on those and didn't bother calling them out. Uh, Rogue One, where it fits in. I think he'll be doing this, updating this soon for Solo, the next Star Wars movie. Uh, but when you abstract and look at this, it's really, it's these principles that have been around for a long time. You have ordinal sorting. So he chose to sort these by the narrative timeline, not the real world timeline in which the films were made. Um, he's used categorical grouping to group these into clusters where they make sense. He's using a geometric shape and a solid boundary. These are the types of things we talk about in the workshop I do on visual displays of information. Uh, I, I love finding atypical examples. So games, I'm a big uh, fan of board games and tabletop games. And you know, if you walk up on a game that you don't know the rules to and you've never seen, it just likes a bunch of cards on the table. But if you know the game, or if you watch it long enough, then you'll see the patterns and you'll see what the players see, right? Uh, this is a game called Star Realms. Anyone ever played it? All right, so does this make sense to you, just looking at it? 
No, let me explain it really quickly. You have this thing called the trade row, and that's the shared space between two players from which you're both going to draw cards, all right? And then you have the, uh, your opponent's space and your space. It's a head-to-head -head two player game. So you have this, this sort of spatial arrangement. Uh, then within the shared space, you have a scrap heap. That's where cards get trashed. They're out of the game. You have explorers. Those are kind of generic, neutral, cheap cards that are OK. If you need to get started, they're always there. You have the trade row, which are the cards you want to buy more than likely. They have varying prices. And they come from the trade deck. So as soon as you buy one from the trade row, you draw from the trade deck and replace it. So that's how that shared row works. And then you can talk about cards played this turn, cards that are persistent turn after turn until they're destroyed, the discard pile, and the deck. And then you have points out to the side. So I'm going through this quickly, but there's meaning there in the way the players arrange things. Space holds meaning. So this is why I get particularly frustrated with things like the grid view that's everywhere. And it hasn't changed since 10 years ago when I first mocked this example up. But I keep bringing it up because it is a problem and an opportunity. So you look at the grid view. And my frustration with it is it looks visual, right? You can see things. But when you abstract and look at the use of space, the arrangement of those things next to each other, above each other, top and bottom, there's no use of spatial arrangement. But there could be, right? You could put things on a matrix to help you make sense of your options. You could get a little more complex and have some different, like a, like a three you know, cones and radial and things closer to the center mean something versus farther away. A simple stack would help, right? Just a stack that, that sorts. And you know if it's in, in good, it means this. And it has, if it's in woo, it has these attributes, right? Uh, I don't know if it's true anymore, but when I pulled this together, one big difference between the fun toys and the good was replaceable batteries versus lithium batteries. That was a constant, right? So if you just had something saying, here are the different levels. Uh, maybe do something more creative, and the size indicates something, right? Some personal meaning. Uh, go through a timeline or something going in the back, but we get this instead, and this is what we've had for a long time. So there's an opportunity to use space in meaningful ways. Finally, epistemic interactions. And fancy word, but what it means is these are interactions that don't actually make a change in the world. So normally when we make an interaction, like you click the submit button, it has an effect on the world, right? If you uh, push that thing or you move something, you're changing something. Epistemic, epistemic interactions are interactions we do that don't really change anything, except they change our thinking. They change what, how we see the space around us. So let me give you some examples. If you've ever played Scrabble and you found yourself rearranging the tiles, what were you doing? You were rearranging tiles to see more possibilities, to see more options. If all of the thinking happened in our heads and our brains, uh, then we wouldn't need to do that, right? But this thing is limited, so we rearrange and we're able to extend our thinking space into our immediate environment. Same with chess. If you've ever held out a piece and hovered over, and you didn't let go, because once you let go, you've made a change in the world, right? You've made your decision, so you hover, and it helps you see a few more plays past that, right? And then you decide, oh, that would be bad, and you return it to the original spot. That's an epistemic interaction. And this challenges kind of the, the common or established notion of how, how we think. And this is in, in neuroscience, this has changed now, but in popular opinion, we, we've still got these ideas, you know, that you have input, we think about stuff, and then we tell our body to output. And the truth is, it's more like this. We don't think than do, we think through doing. So the whole space that we're in is actually the thinking space and how we arrange things and how we interact with things is our thinking space. And when you start to look at things like uh, card sorting exercises or clustering sticky notes on the wall and, and changing the, the sticky notes into a new pattern, you start to realize you're thinking, right? That space, that room is becoming part of the thinking space. It's almost like everyone is now thinking with a shared brain as you move stuff around. So create ways for people to see and play with information. Let's talk about the, the technology one. Uh, so see and play I've been talking about for years. If you want to ask me questions about this, I have tons of examples and ideas and, and uh, lots of research. Use of technology to advance understanding. I've been just running thought experiments to try and figure out where I stand on different things. And so I want to share some of those thought experiments with you. Um, so one is just looking at like sci-fi and commercials and things like that. This is a clip uh, from Iron Man 3. And if you saw this part, it's somewhere about a third into the movie. And he's doing classic detective style, 
you know, detective work, right? He's trying to recreate the crime scene and look at what he knows, make some guesses and some hunches. And what's really awesome about this, and uh, actually I love everything about this, it's a visual representation. So he's walking through this visual uh, recreation of the crime scene. He's also digging into data, getting more information, probing. So you've got the visual representation. You've got the interactions. He's actually interacting with the environment. But then you've got Jarvis, right? Jarvis who's helping him and Jarvis who's extending his thinking. And so when you have all these data visualizations that pull up, you can say, Jarvis, pull up all the data visualizations above 3,000 Kelvin. And psh, the computer does all the computation and does the heavy lifting and a lot of the hard computation work that would be a busy work for a human. What does Tony Stark do? He looks for patterns. He does the judgment and the decision making and some of the things that humans are better equipped at doing. And he says, remove these. OK, look at that one. He's curious about something. He zooms in and looks at that. So you've got this interplay with seeing and playing with information, but also enabled or augmented by the machine. It's sci-fi, right? And it's, its primary purpose is to tell a story. It's fiction. But it actually nails a lot of things. It gets a lot of things right. So let's, uh, let's look at some other examples. Hey, Google, should I sign this legal agreement? Yes. <laughs> Um, I, I'm very wary of things like this, and I'll unpack this a bit more. But, you know, there, there are other options. This is a site I just came across in the last week where they use AI to crawl those legal documents, those terms of service agreements, and come back and actually visually represent the information in a way where you can see the patterns, and you can actually interact with it and play with it. So you can see and play, and it's augmented by the technology, the technology in this, in this case doing all the translation from text to visual. So then you can hover over, and you have legal documents are really good about defining their terms and their vocabulary, so you can hover over and define what those are. You can see you know, what are the types of info they collect, for what reasons, and what options do they give if I want to opt out or, or not. Hey Google, which car should I buy? So how would you feel if uh, we had the almighty machine that's really powerful that could actually do this? I've crunched the numbers. You should buy this 2016 Ford Escape that is available from Bobtown Ford for $18,300. Say yes to purchase. What are you feeling right now? Like, let's say there were no ulterior motives and stuff. You, you just lost agency, right? You, lost, you just gave over judgment. Like, there's a lot, of, a lot of trust. You'd have to have a lot of trust to do this. And that's what kind of scares me about this, is I don't feel like the most efficient option is what we should be striving for in many cases. I actually like the example here where they didn't just get to the, should I sign this agreement? Yes, <laughs> right? They actually said, here, let me help you make sense of it. Let me help you understand what you're about to sign. So how about something that helps me understand my car purchasing options and pros and cons? And maybe I end up in the same conclusion, but I ended up there on my own, right? Supported by the machine. And so if we go back to this, you know, while this one's kind of overt and kind of scary, I think we see this kind of thinking slipping in in more subtle ways. So we go back to this, and I think almost everyone I've shared it to says, yes, I'd love to see that example. That's a better example. It's a better display of information. But then there was another idea that was popular on Twitter about six months ago. What if you just went to the sign and you had your app, and you could just point it, and through artificial intelligence and machine learning, it could say, oh, yes, you can park here for two hours, but be sure to move your car by 4.30. Isn't this better? Isn't this easier? Like, that's what a lot of people were saying. And, and here's what I think. I think, yes, it provides an efficient answer. That's what that one does. I would argue the one on the left, though, also provides an efficient answer, but it does something else. It fosters understanding, and it helps you form a mental mo model of the parking schedule and knowing, like, when can you park here, when you can you not. If you just rely on a yes or no, you never have that mental model, and you pull out the app every time. If you actually learn to recognize the patterns and see what's going on, then you know intuitively when you pull up, I can park here, and I'm good for the next three hours, right? Because you know the system. Now, you make, make a judgment call and say, you know what? I'm in a new town, and I'm only here for the weekend. I'm never going to be back here again, so I'll, I'm fine deferring the judgment and the pattern recognition, and that's fine. But here's another example I like to use. I was in Tokyo uh, for, a, for a conference, and yeah, the Tokyo subway system is one of the most complex, confusing ones um, in the world. And while I was there, I definitely was just, tell me where to get on, where to get off, right? I didn't need an understanding of the mental model. But I guarantee you, if I moved to Tokyo and was going to be there more than a few months, then I would want a system that doesn't 
make me not think about it and just tell me where to go. I would want a system that helps me understand and form a mental model of the subway station. So at some point, two or three months, six months later, I don't have to pull out my app. I'm like, oh, I know which one to catch. I know where to get off, right? I start to understand intuitively the system. And we do that naturally. But is there a way we could use the technology to help us get there quicker and not just do all that work for us? See the distinction? And I think there are plenty of areas where we're not thinking about it and we're giving this over to algorithms and to machine recommendations. So choosing the best health insurance plan, understanding privacy policies, understanding any kind of legal agreement for that case, um, purchasing things like a TV, planning a vacation, choosing healthy food options, establishing a workout routine. There's all these things that I would argue the quick answer, the efficient answer, is probably not better than helping people form their own understanding, their own judgment, and then arrive at that answer. And I think this is what we're talking about, efficiency of task completion versus friction, introducing friction to create understanding. But the friction is in the form of a playful visual environment, something you can play with and see, like the, like the um, stuff I showed you earlier from Brett Victor and Nikki Case. Those are complex things, right? But you're playing with it, and they've made that learning, instead of insurmountable, they've made it accessible. So you can play with really complex ideas. And the warning here is left unchecked. I think technology will dumb us down in ways that should make us very uncomfortable. And I, I cut it, but I was going to include, um, for those of you who watched Friends back in the day, there was a scene where uh, Rachel made trifle for uh, some, yeah, and she, she followed the directions exactly. And of course, everyone in the room is like, trifle's a dessert, right? And it's got all these layers of whipped cream and things, and she's got like beef in it. <laughs> and they're like, wait, what's going on? She's like, I follow the directions exactly. I did exactly what it said. And it turns out like two of the pages were stuck together, but she did exactly what she was instructed to do and didn't see a problem. Like she, she just did what, what was told. And we think, well, that's silly. That's sitcom, right? But we've heard stories of people driving their cars off piers, right? Because that's where the maps told them to go. And so when I say left unchecked, technology will dumb us down in ways that should make us very uncomfortable. That's what I'm thinking about. Like, do we want that kind of future? And we talk about AI for good and things like that. Um, another thought exercise I did was this whole AR thing. And Luke Rabluski had been doing a challenge online, like imagine AR in the real world, some real world applications. And so I did this with board games, because I'm a big board game player. And, uh, and so this first one, this is a game called Suburbia. And Suburbia is a game I actually prefer playing on the iPad over the, the physical version. And the reason being is there's a lot of calculations you have to make when you're going around this. The game, the board gets bigger. There's more numbers you have to keep in your head. Um, and with a lot of games, there's calculations, but then there's choice. And the fun in games is the choice, making the difficult choice, the choice between a short-term reward or a long-term reward or things like that. What's not fun about games, especially like this, is the calculations and the computation. And on the iPad version, you can drag around your tiles, and it does the calculations for you. So then you're left saying, huh, do I want to put my tile here or there or there? You're left making the difficult choice. And so I was imagining AR in the real world, and if I could you know, be playing it, and maybe I've got goggles on or something, or, or retinal implants, who knows? And I say, calculate. And then I hold the piece over, and it does the calculations in the exact same way the iPad app does. And then I can move it around and see the calculations. Like, it seems like that gets to that letting the machine do the stuff the machine does best and letting humans do the things humans do best. So then I took this in some other areas, and, and I was uh, you know, teaching my, one of my boys how to play 42. It's a game I grew up playing with my parents. And I was thinking of the role I was playing, explaining it to him and telling him, OK, you need to bid 30, but no higher, because it's not a great hand. Make four is the suit, lead with a double four. So I'm coaching him, right? And I was like, what if you had technology that was able to coach you? And the, the command was recommend. But then I started fast forwarding this, and well, what's the difference between recommend and cheat? <laughs> right? Especially where there's probability, and it's not a certain thing. And, and you know, think of poker, and you know, what if you, know, you have an AR AI you know, thing that can tell you, count the cards into the probability and say, yep, you should fold. There's an 83% chance that someone will beat your hand. And then I said, well, what's the difference between that and like chess? And chess is a game, I mean, from a computer's point of view, whether it's tic-tac-toe or go, like it's all computation, right? And plotting out every path. There's no hidden information. With poker, you know what the cards are, but you don't know what cards people have. So there's hidden information. So I'm like, well, between a probability game and a uh, open information game, like 
what's the difference? And, and not, you know, I think in the context of games, there's a challenge and it's a human challenge, right? So it's the same reason in sports, we don't allow a lot of augmentation. But in terms of other areas of our life, like reading that privacy policy, I think this is an interesting lens to look through things. So whether it's tic-tac-toe on one end, connect four on that end, or chess and go on the other end, it's all computation that a machine could do and could help us. Like, it's the same reason we use calculators, right? It's just more efficient, more effective. Not that we shouldn't be able to do that ourselves, but does it make sense to do that all the time, especially as it gets more and more complicated? But then you look at something like poker or 42 or Settlers of Catan, if you play that, and you have hidden information, you have die rolls, you have randomness, and suddenly it's, it's a lot more complex. And those are the things where like a machine could help me, but I have to be there making judgment calls and you know, weighing in and having my style of play. All right, so here are my conclusions about the, the machine stuff. We should all be asking questions about these things, importance personal relevance. Should I outsource this knowledge? How important is this to me personally? If I'm visiting Tokyo for a few days, is it okay to let the app do all the work for me? If I'm going to be there for six months, should I put a little more of myself in it? Understanding. What am I losing by not learning about this topic myself? Motives. Who programmed these algorithms? What are their motives? Right? Why can't I see the algorithms? Uh, complexity. Is this even a job for a machine? What is changing about the situation? What is true? What is a judgment? Right? Particularly for complex things, I don't want the machine doing that, right? Validity, is the data true and accurate? So everything that the algorithms are running through, is the data even sound, right? Or is it fake data? Boundaries, what data was included or omitted? Like how broad, what was the zoom level? Um, competency, are these recommendations even any good? Because, you know, I'm talking about the machine like it's perfect, but as we heard earlier, and where we're at, it's not, especially in the early days, it's a learning, it's machine learning, right? So it gets better, but it doesn't start off good. And you have things that work 80% of the time, and then they don't, right? So where is the machine learning? Where's the algorithm? How competent is it? So see and play with information, use technology to advance understanding. And then the final thing I wanna talk about is work and learn from each other. So here, lots of rough thoughts, not super organized, um, but this is what I've been thinking a lot more lately, both in my job and for the, the chapter of the book I'm writing, which is really people. And uh, again, it goes back to information and understanding, but in this case, I want you to imagine, imagine a scenario where if every one of you had a few pieces of a puzzle, and I asked you to assemble it, what, how would you go about that? All right, and this is a thought exercise I've been running. Everyone has a few pieces of the puzzle, 500 piece puzzle, or a 5,000 piece, or maybe a 50,000 piece puzzle, right? You all have pieces of a puzzle. How would we collectively coordinate our activities to assemble that puzzle? And it's a fun one to think about, like probably having a picture of the box would help, right? So you know the thing you're building. Uh, maybe clustering into groups, like, oh yeah, I have lots of white pieces, they have lots of red pieces, that might be a strategy, right? We'd have different strategies. And I've been looking at that and saying, okay, well, how does that translate back to how organizations run? And you think about things like the vision document or the prototype, giving everyone a shared vision of the future. You think about uh, rules and patterns and clustering into teams based on things. There's some patterns you can learn there. The problem with this analogy is uh, when you're talking about humans and systems, these are complex things, not complicated things. And so it's more like you have 10 different puzzle boxes mixed together. Half of them are missing pieces. A lot of the pieces themselves, someone's taken scissors to and cut off things. And uh, it's just a mess, right? And now you're supposed to put it all together. That's a really wicked problem. And uh, so I've been thinking a lot about that. And how do you do that? And you know, translated. Everyone, imagine everyone working in different silos, everyone having their own agendas, everyone has access to different information and or widely different perspectives and motives and all these things. How would you even begin to coordinate people to create a shared understanding? And so the books I've been reading look like this. So the Fifth Discipline, Systems book, Everyone Culture, Communities of Practice, um, Making Sense of the Organization, Reinventing Organizations, a lot of books that have the word organization in them and in reference to people. And uh, at my, my job, I've been thinking a lot about how do I get people from different silos working together and coordinating their efforts, because what they're building is a shared experience for the uh, end customer in the end. So um, I've been collecting and, and brainstorming and coming up with these lenses. And right now, there's about 60 different lenses and things to try or things to monitor or things to be aware of. 
Uh, the struggle I had was, you know, coming up with lenses was no problem. Uh, it was actually organizing them. And to give you an example, like this was some early clustering, but this was something I just called personal filters. I put baggage in, in parentheses there. And those were things like the lens of assumptions. Like you walk into something and you assume you have like, knowledge or the lens of perspective or the lens of privilege. Like oftentimes we're not even aware of privilege that we bring to projects. Uh, the lens of openness to new ideas. Uh, the lens of prior experiences. Uh, all these things that we have to attend to. The lens of mental models. Um, I, the mental model one, give you a, to put some color on that. I remember I was working on a super small project for my previous boss, and he had wanted me to do something. Uh, it was a way to pay on a third-party site. And we listened to his request, and what we mocked up was something very much like PayPal, a button you could drop in. And they came back, no, 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 that's not it at all. And he kept describing it. And we were like, so that's like PayPal, right? It's like the button. And he's like, no, no, no. And, and I, then I asked him the question, when you were asking this, what site were you thinking of? What's your reference point? He said, well, I was thinking of like Amazon and how if you have American Express, it can be integrated into the thing and you have points now that you can spend on the site. I'm like, oh, I see how you're seeing the problem now. And so I saw his mental model, his orientation on it, very different from what I heard and the orientation we all had, which was PayPal. We heard drop a button in. He had a tighter integration in mind. And so that lens is just saying, you know, ask people how they see the problem. What is the problem like, right? Because if you actually see it through their eyes, it might change that consensus building or that coordination. And, you know, in the spirit of, of recognizing that it's not just me, it's coordinating people, I took this to Twitter and Facebook and then some Slack groups I'm a part of. And I said, hey, I got a few minutes to help me with my book. I'm working on the chapter explores coordination for understanding. And to stress test my own thinking, here's my question. I actually reversed the question. Rather than, you know, brainstorm things to help people work together, I asked the opposite. What prevents us from working together to solve complicated problems? And I got a whole bunch of responses. And then I used that and started clustering those. Um, did lots of models and modeling and sketches to try to make sense of it all. And started off a continuum and did a matrix and threw that away and did some circles and ended up with something more illustrative. And, and where I've landed at this point, again, it's, these are thoughts in motion. Is I've got five solid categories. There might be a six because there are a few outliers, the miscellaneous ones, right? Um, but what I've landed on is there, there are standards ways we communicate. And so as IAs, we talk about controlled vocabularies, but it's also like cultural vocabularies. Like uh, if I'm speaking to an engineer, uh, they may say design and interface, but they don't mean what I mean when I say design and interface. The same words, different meanings, right? Uh, with the controlled vocabulary, if we say customer, are we thinking about the same person? Are we talking about the same customer? Especially important in uh, complex spaces where you have lots of customers. Invisible environments. So this is how we align conceptually. So things like vision statements, mission documents, or prototypes, they're really a conceptual framework to help us align around what we're doing, where we're going. Visible environments, the ways we collaborate. So these are the things. It could be physically the room, like having a uh, command center or a war room. It could be the virtual tools we use, like Slack or like Google Docs. Um, this one I'm particularly sensitive to because just the slightest amount of friction in our digital tools can be the difference between someone participating or not. And I've found myself guilty of this where, uh, you know, working in an environment that uses Word, I'm like, dang it, if we just had Google Docs, it'd be easier to collaborate around Docs. And Word just, it's got just enough friction that it's hard to do that. That was part of why I love Slack uh, when we first started using it was it removed a lot of friction. Things that used to take two clicks now took one drag, right? It's, and that little bit can make all the difference between everyone participating and sharing or not. Um, behaviors. These are personal behaviors and shared behaviors. So with personal behaviors, becoming aware of some of your biases and some of the things you do. Shared behaviors, those would be things like team norms and agreeing on those things. Perspectives. I went over that earlier, I was on the previous iteration, and, but it's your personal perspectives, but also shared perspectives on the team, and lots of ways to see, and not just see, but see differently, see the problem from different lenses. Uh, so a few examples of this, just I include this one more for humor. This is on controlled vocabularies. Um, if you're into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and blockchain, this will be funny to you. If you're not, then you'll be like, what's the joke? Um, looking for someone who knows about Bitcoin, I'm a blockchain expert with specialization in cryptocurrency. I said Bitcoin. Did you not hear me clearly? Um, and the explanation there is, is 
Blockchain is the technology beneath all of it. Cryptocurrency is a particular application of the technology, and Bitcoin is a particular type of cryptocurrency, of which there are hundreds, perhaps thousands now. So yes, that person on the left is the absolute the right person they need to be talking to, but the vocabulary has them talking past each other. Um, I, canvases. There's the lens of Canvas. That's one of the cards, and uh, not specifically the business model Canvas, but Canvases in general. I think they are a powerhouse of a tool to get people to collaborate. Because what they do is they don't weigh in or make assessments. They just say, hey, in this case, if you're going to run a business, here are nine questions you should be able to answer. Answer them. And it can be something you fill out on your own. It could be sticky notes on the wall that you fill out collectively. But it's a great facilitator, and it facilitates critical conversations. Um, uh, another example of a canvas, loosely defined. How many of you have gotten to the argument over what is a, uh, what is a sandwich or not? Anyone got into that discussion? So I was backpacking this summer uh, with a bunch of teenage boys and a uh, Boy Scout trip. And that for 30 minutes, that was the debate. It was like, what's a sandwich? What's not? You know, is a, uh, so something wrapped in a pita bread a sandwich? What about a hot dog? Is it a sandwich? And all these things. And so it was very binary and very much like either in or out. And, and we were talking about examples. But then I came across this a month ago. I'm like, yes, this is a canvas whereby you could not argue the examples, but actually figure out what your definitions are and how you differ. And so you could actually look at this and figure out where are you? Are you a hardline traditionalist? Are you a <laughs> structural rebel, ingredient neutral? Uh, and I like this. Like, it's, it's a good analysis of the, the, the problem of, of what is a sandwich. I'll just let you look at that for a moment. <laughs> The sandwich alignment chart. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, things like this where everyone's working together in a shared space and adding things. Uh, this particular place was a customer journey, and we had all the lanes, and we had the back-end infrastructure. And what was great about this was day two after putting this up and sharing it with the team, the person from finance and who handled all the taxes said, uh, he didn't put a lane for us, and we're not important for these three stages, but when it comes to these two, we're critical. And we're like, Yes, that's, that's why we put it up, to foster or encourage that type of participation. Uh, this is something interesting. So historically, our tools have forced one view on us. And so it's interesting. If you look at Kanban boards, Gantt charts, and resource planning tools, uh, there's about 11 points of data that they all tend to cover. But what they prioritize is completely different. And so when you choose a tool, often you're choosing, do you want to prioritize like how we get it done, you know, a Kanban board? Do you want to prioritize projections and roadmap planning and estimation, estimations? Or do you want to prioritize capacity and who can do what, what's their workload, right? But it's the same data, it's just different representations. What I'm excited about is in the last year, uh, we are starting to see a rise of tools that let us switch views on the same data. And yes, engineers and programmers and people who work with data have always been able to do this, but now there are consumer tools that let you click a button and change views. So uh, this is one. This is uh, Zenkit, I believe. A company called Target Process is doing this. Uh, Coda is another one where you can do it. And that's one of the things they're advertising is everyone can share the data, but you can get what you want out of it. You can see the patterns you need to see. This is new, being able to change your perspective on the data. Uh, so to be continued, that's a work in progress. Uh, maybe a year or two from now, there'll be another card deck or something uh, for helping coordinate people and organizations. Uh, but to wrap this up, we need to assemble information for ourselves and for others. We need all, every one of us, to become information architects. And I say that not to just us who practice it, but I've found as complex problems get more complex, everyone who's involved needs to learn how to be an IA, or else it's hard to communicate and hard to work together. Um, we want to move from information to understanding. And to wrap up, I've switched the three topics into challenge questions. So think about what you're working on. Can people see and play with information? Uh, does technology encourage or take away learning? And are you helping people work together and learn from each other? With that, thank you very much. <laughs>